Well, welcome to First this morning. If you have a Bible with you or a, sm- a phone with you, you can turn to Acts chapter 11. Uh, that's where we're going to spend most of our time here this morning. We've been going through the book of Acts this year and just kind of bit by bit going through and seeing what God did in the early church. And we've seen some really tremendous things happen. And this week we're going to look at the household of Cornelius. We looked at it last week. We're going to follow up a little bit on it this week. But I'm, I'm really excited just to, to share on Father's Day because I think the role of fathers is really, really important in the life of children. Um, one of the things that we see happen in our, our culture and our society is we put people against each other. We put moms against dads, dads against moms, uh, parents against kids, kids against... And what happens is, is it's, it's an effort to see the destruction of family. And it's, it's the number one tactic, one of the number one tactics of the enemy is to destroy families, to destroy the relationships and marriages and, and all of those things that the enemy works really hard to do. And what happens as a result is we don't value one another for who we are. We don't value that there are really great men who live on this earth. There are really great men who go to our church. There are really great women on this earth. There are really great women who are part of this church. That If we could just value each other rather than this person's more valuable than this person. We see this, this, this battle in society of one's more important than the other. And I think it would be wise for us just to make sure that we value dads the best that we can. And to value moms the best that we can to value our children and I think when, when we do that I think really what we're doing is we're we're valuing God and what God has given to each one of us and so when we value God first and put God first and make God a priority those values fall into the right places and and so I just wanted to I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about fathers today um, even though it's Father's Day we're going to talk a little bit about Cornelius and and uh, his household and we'll get into that but I just wanted to take a moment And say to all of you dads, all of you guys that are in this room, trying hard to live for God, trying to do the right thing, um, you're extremely valuable to this society because there's a lot of guys who aren't. And so when when, when we see good things happening, it's good for us to point those out. So all of you dads in this room, continue to do what you're doing. Raise your children to love God, love your wife well, love your family well, love your friends well, and love God well. The best thing than any father will ever do for his children is to love Jesus well. The best gift that you can ever give as a mom to your children is to love Jesus Christ with all of your heart. And so if we do those things well, I think God will set the rest in motion for us. Now, in the book of Acts, we've seen a little bit of a transition. The first seven chapters in the book of Acts are focused on Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells the disciples, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the first seven chapters of Acts are really about the book, uh, really about Jerusalem. And then 8 through 12 are about Judea and Samaria and the surrounding areas, and that's where we find ourselves today. But in Acts chapter 9, something tremendous happened. Saul, who was a persecutor of Christians, and he was someone who imprisoned Christians, he participated in the death of Christians, has now been converted. The person who hated Christians is now a Christian. It's funny how God works sometimes. And he begins to preach and teach and, and start his ministry. And then at the end of Acts chapter 9, we see kind of go back to Peter. And Peter's in Lydda. And he heals this man named Aeneas who's been paralyzed for eight years. And then he goes to Joppa because there's a lady there named Tabitha who's died. And she's raised from the dead. Comes back to life. And as a result of both of those, those events, people gave their lives to the Lord. People came to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 10, something completely different happened that changed everything about the future of the church because beforehand, Jews did not associate with Gentiles. They didn't eat in their homes. They didn't have them over. They they didn't have a good relationship with them. They were virtually enemies of each other. Peter has a vision to go into the home of a Gentile And Cornelius has a vision. They have these paired visions about what God's going to do. And in Cornelius' vision, he just says, go to Joppa and find this man named Peter. And so he sends some people to go find Peter. In Peter's vision, he sees this sheet come down all the way from heaven, and it's full of all of these animals that would be considered impure and unclean. And Peter was a good Jewish boy. He was a good Jewish man. He knew I was not going to let anything. He even said, I've never let anything. I've never let anything impure or unclean. 
passed through my lips. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. He was a good Jew. But now, Cornelius, a Gentile, is going to have an opportunity to know Jesus. And now Gentiles from that point on are going to have an opportunity to know Jesus. This was an extremely important pivotal. Their whole mindset, we'll see it in just a second, was that Jews and Gentiles, that Jews could be followers of Jesus and Gentiles could not be followers of Jesus. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 11. Um, We're going to start in verse number 1. It says, the apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So word started getting out about it. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? This was unheard of. This was diabolical for him to have done such a thing. And it was so ingrained in them that they had a hard time understanding. So they criticized him for what he did because their understanding was they would have to be circumcised in order to be Christians. In other words, if you wanted salvation, you would need surgery. I want you to think of church plants for a few minutes. Imagine that. Before you come into church, you have to go out to the little medical tent before you can come in and be a part of the church and every man has, has to have that procedure. Think of what their lives must have been like and how really what it was was they were making it difficult for people to become followers of Jesus Christ, the opposite of what we should do. We should make it as easy as we possibly can to help people know who Jesus Christ is. And so what we see in the, these people here, they, they were more of the Pharisee type. They were, it was so ingrained in them, but they were followers of Jesus. Some Pharisees had been converted, and they, they, they criticized him. They were more concerned with the law than they were the people following Jesus. Now, we can look at them and get mad and think that they were jerks or whatever we may feel, but I, I, I don't know if it's they were being... Intolerant, or I don't know if they were just, it was so ingrained that they just didn't know any other way, if it was just completely out of ignorance. But we'll see later on how that plays out. They were more concerned with following the law than they were people knowing Jesus. And we've got to be very careful not to let other things get in the way. I mentioned this earlier in the week earlier this week that it's easy to be critical of people when you haven't had the same experience with God that they have. Um, Saul had an experience with God. He saw this sheet come down from heaven with all these unclean animals and God specifically spoke to him and said, don't call anything unclean that I call clean. He had a vision from God that that the others hadn't had. Cornelius had had a vision also from God. But they experienced these things and other people didn't know about it. They didn't know specifics about this, this vision. And so they're, they're criticizing him because of it. And it's easy to criticize people when we don't have the full story. I think that's just part of what we have learned in our lives. And another thing that we've learned in our lives is there's a really big difference between critical thinking and a critical spirit. Critical thinking is a good thing. We should think about things. We should think deeply about things. We should try to understand why things are the way they are, why things operate they, the way they operate. That's critical thinking, using the intellect that God has given us, using the wisdom that God has given us to do that. A critical spirit is a close sister of pride. A critical spirit is someone just criticizing someone because they're better than them, that they're further along than them, that they know better than them, that they haven't made the dumb decisions that they have made. They're critical of other people. We live in a very critical and cynical society. And so while it's important for us to think critically and use, listen, if you want to know more about someone, ask God. He will give you discernment. God will help you to discern about people. And yes, we live in a world where people make really bad decisions. But guess what? We've all made bad decisions as well at some point in our lives. We don't need to, people don't need more criticism. They need more hope. They need more love from the Christian community. And so we need to do a better job at that. So Peter continues on and he begins to lay out what happened in his vision. He begins to share uh, uh, what God did and how God spoke to him. And let's pick it up in verse number 14. This is him speaking of Cornelius' vision. And he says, he will bring, speaking of Peter, he will bring you a message through which you and all of your household will be saved. He brought them the gospel for the very first time that they had ever heard it before. And they responded by believing it and becoming Christians. 
As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God or stand in God's way? When they heard this, they no longer They had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So Peter explains to them, here's what happened. Here's what happened with this sheet. Here's what Cornelius happened. That all happened, it came together, and I went. Now think of Peter going into their home. This is this is a this is the first time he's ever been into this home. Have you ever gone into someone's home that you were a little skeptical of? You're like, okay, I'm going to go in here. Just imagine, Peter, he's never been in the home of a Gentile before. He has these six witnesses with him. I could just imagine Peter, he's probably like, okay, you guys go first. You guys go first. He lets them all get in the house, and then he's out there. He's, while he's probably out there, he's probably just praying in the spirit. The next thing you know, he's like, okay, okay. Takes a deep breath, and he walks in the house. And then he starts the most awkward conversation you'll ever see. Like he just helps preachers like me to realize that God can use foolish language from, from, from somebody. Because Peter gets in front of him and he says, the first things he says to these people are, you know that I'm not supposed to associate with you, right? I'm not supposed to be in your home. You realize that, right? And then, then he goes further and he says, I now realize that I'm not supposed to call anything unclean that he calls clean. In other words, until yesterday, every single one of you that are in this household, if he was in their house, would be like, until yesterday, all of you were unclean and impure. So let me tell you about Jesus, okay? I mean, these aren't the great leading lines into helping people know who Jesus is, but God used it to help them. There was a divide between the two, and God uses sometimes our foolishness through the Holy Spirit to speak to people's lives. But it says in verse number 14, he will bring you a message through which you and your household will be saved. God is wanting you to reach your household. Now, Cornelius was a centurion, and it's most likely that he probably wasn't married. Um, He might have had some concubines. If he did, he might have had children that way. It doesn't really tell us anything about that at this point in time, and so we don't really know. But he invited, it told us last chapter, he invited all of his close relatives and close friends. Those, those were his household, the people in his community, the people who were in his, his, his close relationship. And, and one had a great relationship with him as his family members and friends. He invited there. And all of them, it says all of them, him and his household would become saved. I said it earlier. I'll say it again. I think this is the most important thing that some of us need to hear today is that the best thing that you can do as a man, is to love Jesus at home. The best thing that you can do as a woman is to love Jesus at home. It's one thing to come here and you can lift your hands. We can lift our hands. We can praise God. We can say all those great things and then we get home and we might even be on the way to church. Have you ever been on the way to church and you like yell at your kids and then you're like, okay, I'm going to church. I probably need to repent of that. Or sometimes during worship you do repent. Or maybe it's after service and you're on your way home and you're trying to figure out what you want for lunch and you got four people in your family and all four people want the, want the opposite things. And Sometimes we're different when we're at home than when we're with other people. And I think it's just really good for us to understand we need to, we need to love Jesus well in front of our kids. Some people grow up in homes with awful home lives. And it's normal to them. And so then when they experience a normal relationship or a loving relationship between people, they don't know how to respond to it and it doesn't go well. But I think it's good for us, all of us, whether you're married or not married, to be a man and a woman of God is the best thing that you can possibly do, not just for your household, but for everybody in your life. I don't know if you're catching the narrative of the book of Acts up to this point, but what we've seen happen through these first 11 chapters is really this. God's using two primary ways of reaching people and people becoming followers of Jesus. And the two ways that I see it happening the most are through the power of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the persecution of the church. And we're gonna see how the persecution of the church really played into what was going on in Antioch. So, Now we're going to shift from where Peter's at to now Antioch. So let's go on in verse number 19. Chapter 11, verse number 19. 
We've seen the power of God. They saw it that day when Cornelius and his household, they became Christians. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they were baptized. We saw it on the day of Pentecost. We've seen it happen in several occasions. People being saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, set free. And the persecution of the church is what scattered the church to where they are now. So verse number 19, it says this. Now, those who have been scattered by the persecution that broke out with Stephen was, was killed, when Stephen was killed, have traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word among, uh, only among Jews. Verse 20, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, or Gentiles, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So persecution scattered the church. Remember, Saul was going around and imprisoning Christians. And, putting, uh, and so they, they kind of left Jerusalem and went out to surrounding areas. And then Saul went to Damascus to do that. And that's when he got uh, converted to become a follower of Jesus Christ. But persecution scattered them. Stephen being killed actually helped benefit the church more than it, it hurt the church. And so some are going and they're just going to the Jews with their faith and sharing the faith with them because that's what was normal and that's what was ordinary. That's what they understood that Jews would, would, would be able to become followers of God. And some of them weren't going to the Gentiles because they simply didn't believe the Gentiles could be followers of Jesus Christ. But some of them, some men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks telling them. That, so there were people who did go and speak to the Gentiles and they were becoming followers of Jesus Christ. It was a wonderful thing. So we see the persecuted, scattered church is growing. It's actually helpful to the church. What the enemy wants to use to distract the church and to stop the church in its tracks cannot and will not stop the church from being what God wants it to be. Acts chapter 11, let's go on in verse number 22 because really what's happening is revival is kind of breaking out. There are lots of people, big numbers of people coming to know the Lord. In verse 22 it says, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem. Uh, revival wasn't happening in Jerusalem, unfortunately. And they sent Barabbas to Antioch. When he had arrived, he saw the grace of God, what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord and with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So there's already kind of revival happening. Then Barnabas goes, and more, more people are coming to know the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. Remember, remember Saul's been in Tarsus. This is like 10 years after the resurrection. I know we're in Acts chapter 11, and we're like, we think these things are happening in days and weeks. This is like 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus, this is happening. So he went to, get Tars he went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, when they were called Christians in Antioch for the first time, it wasn't a compliment. This wasn't a term of endearment. This was a mocking tone, a mockery uh, thing that they would call Christians. But this is the first time recorded that they're actually called Christians. Isn't it funny that something that the enemy was using to mock Christians now has become who we are and who has become part of our identity? We are Christians. We are followers of Jesus Christ. If we go on in Acts chapter 27 and, and throughout the rest of the chapter, there's some prophets that come and they speak of a famine that's going to happen. And this famine's going to come. And, and so we learn really one of the first times that we see the church in Jerusalem hears about this and they, they receive, really they receive um, an offering so they, to, to bring some relief effort to the famine that's going to be coming and so they, 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 they get their resources together and they, they get them to places where Barnabas and Saul are and others are to, to make sure that they're provided for. And this is really what the whole, whole idea of missions is. Missions really focuses around this idea that a church somewhere can help a church somewhere else. That's what missions is. We're the people of God. And if you, if you go out this door afterwards, I encourage you to go out. We have a photo booth for you to go take pictures with your dad or your family, whatever you want to do. 
But, but out there, right behind that is a bunch of missionaries. Missionaries that we support every single month because of your faithful giving and your generosity. We support 25 missionaries and local organizations helping to spread the good news around the world. And we do that because we're a church here. I can't go to Africa. Well, I could go to Africa. God hasn't called me to go to Africa and, and live in Africa at this point in my life. But he uses churches. There's churches all over the world who are sending missionaries. Do you know what's really sad? Is that other countries are sending missionaries to America right now. That's sad to me with all of our resources and everything that we have in America. It's when people somewhere can help people somewhere else. It may just be someone that you work with. It may be a neighbor up the street. Maybe different, different places we go. And we can help other people. So we really see in chapter 11, there, a few of the things that we see. We see some, criticize, some criticism happening uh, to, to Peter and this, this, new, this new way of understanding that Gentiles can become Christians as well. That they criticized him and then they heard a story. And after they heard a story, it says they rejoiced and they, were, they praised God because of it. There was revelation from God that there, there needs to be a new way of thinking. We need to think bigger than just ourselves. That's a great message that we all need to just hear is that there's, there's more people out there. All those things that we see as unclean and impure, those are men and women and children that need Jesus Christ. And so we need to be people who go. We need to have a fresh revelation that there are men and women and children all over our city who need Jesus Christ as their Lord. They need to be forgiven. They need to be set free from addiction. They need to be healed and whole through Jesus Christ. And Jesus is their only hope. So they had revelation that God had done this amazing work in the Gentiles. And then we see once again the persecuted church. We see what's going on in the persecuted church. It's scattered. And now hundreds, thousands of people are coming to know the Lord in, in these communities that it, it, it mentioned in, in Antioch. And then we see God's provision. The church in Jerusalem says, hey, those people are hurting. Those people are in need. We're going to send some resources to them because they need relief from what they're experiencing. We as a church, this world is full of people who need relief from, from their life experience, from things that they may be going through. Some might be a hardship. Some might be the loss of a family member. Some might be the loss of a job. But providing for that, providing and helping, God helps us to meet their needs. But what I love about this text and what I love about the narrative of Acts is we see this. We see God saving people through the persecution of the church and through the power of God. Now, I don't know too many people in here if I said, okay, we're going to get everyone signed up. You've got to sign up for either wanting to see the power of God or the persecution of, of the church happen. And so all of you who want to sign up for the pers to be persecuted, you all line up over on this side of church. And all of you who want to see the power of God line up over here. Nobody's signing up to be persecuted. Nobody's signing up to be thrown in jail because of our faith or to be killed for our faith. No one is signing up for that. But guess what? I can guarantee you there are men and women all over the world today in places who are being killed simply because of their faith. This very day. We have it made in America. So we don't experience a lot of persecution. Sure, there may be some persecution that's coming to church, and we see things happening in courts and all those sorts of things, but what we, what, so we will see persecution, I believe, one day in America. I don't know if it'll be in our lifetimes or not the way that they saw it. But I would say a lot of us in this room want to see the power of God work in people's lives. We want to see people being healed. We want to see people being set free of addictions. We want to see people healed and whole. We want to see the power of God work. We want to see people like, like the home of Cornelius, the household of Cornelius, saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to see those things happen. We want to see the power of God happen. That's why one of the, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about us taking a concerted effort as a church to pray on Wednesdays is so that we'll see more of the power of God in our church and in our lives specifically. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but the power of God is not limited to these four walls around us today. It's anywhere, it's everywhere, it's in you. And it wants to work through you. When you go to work, you can pray for people and they can be whole, healed. 
So this morning, we see hundreds, thousands of people coming to know the Lord because of the power of God and because of the persecution of the church. And this morning, I think it's important every time we gather together to say, hey, is there anything in me that shouldn't be in me? Have I fallen far from God? Am I, am I not living the life that I should be living? Am I just far away from God? You're not li- we're not living for God. We're not, we're not followers of Jesus. But I wonder if this morning, I wonder if this Father's Day, God is calling you to come home. So I want you to stand with me this morning as we close. I'm just going to pray over you as we leave today. And